Hi, I'm Mark Canoe. You may recognize me from such fine quality educational videos as D-Day in Chemistry, we blew up the whole thing, and what's in that tackle box, and bonding? Are you kidding me? Well, today we're going to look very quickly at bonding and electronegativity and how we can predict what kind of a bond between two atoms that there could possibly be based off of their electronegativities. So when we look at chemistry, there's two basic bonds I'm very interested in chemistry, ionic and covalent. And with ionic bonding, basically one atom, there's going to transfer one or more electrons to the other atom, which will receive that transferred electron. Okay, That's ionic bonding. And characteristics of ionic bonding, we can look at a high melting point, can easily be dissolved in water, and can conduct electricity. Okay, now, that being said, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, COVID, an example of ionic bonding would in fact be salt, NaCl, or sodium chloride, potassium chloride, um, things like that. Those are, combine a metal with a non-metal, and you typically you'll get a salt. And characteristics for ionic bonds, they have a very high melting point. Okay, very high melting point. We can easily dissolve them in water because water can tear them apart. And then, of course, it can conduct electricity in a liquid state. The second type of bond that's involved here is covalent bond. Now, covalent is a little bit different in that the electrons are shared between the two atoms that join together. This is different than as opposed to transferring one electron to, from one atom to the other. Uh, covalent bonds, basically, they have a lower melting point. They can melt more easily than something that's ionically bonded. Sugar is a great example of something that's covalently bonded, and that's pretty easy, and, um, but it does not conduct electricity uh, in a liquid state but it can dissolve pretty easily into water, okay? So, we looked at the difference between ionic and covalent. Ionic, transfer of electrons, high melting point, and can conduct electricity. Covalent, sharing the electrons, low melting point, and again, it doesn't conduct electricity very well. Okay. So let's look at electronegativity and bonding. That's the next thing that we're going to be looking at here. The idea about what is electronegativity. Well, the idea behind electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract a shared electron from another atom. How much, how badly does the, uh, electro, the atom want the electron? Now, if we look here, here's an electronegativity chart, okay? And the higher the number, the higher your electronegativity number, well, that basically means that the, it wants the atom way more. Okay, and let's see, I don't know if I can, uh, how well I can do this. All right, but let's see. All right, let me shift a little bit. There, there we go. All right, so I got a little bit closer here so I can show a couple of things. This is the electronegativity table. And you may notice here on the right-hand side, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, they don't have a number value underneath because this number here is the atomic number, how many protons are in the nucleus. But you notice these guys do not have a number underneath. Well, wait a minute, why is that? Well, they're noble gases. And as noble gases, Let's face it, they could care less. They don't want any electrons. They don't want to give electrons. They don't want to receive electrons. They don't want to share electrons because they're happy. Their outermost layer of valence electrons is full. Yeah, can you imagine? So that's why we don't have a value here. Now, if we start going in here, like oxygen and fluorine and chlorine, you may notice that, ooh, those are fairly high numbers. Okay, fluorine is the highest one with an electronegativity value of 4.0, okay, and it really wants the uh, electrons badly, very badly, okay. Now, if we swing to the other side of the table, okay, you got to notice hydrogen is 2.1, then you look at lithium and sodium and potassium and you notice it's getting lower and lower and lower. 
Remember, hydrogen is its own case. Hydrogen is its own deal. I mean, yes, we put it up here, but it has its own thing. It doesn't behave quite like everybody else here. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1. Now, let's look at these guys here. If you notice, lithium 1.0, sodium 1.0. They're not very interested in attracting an electron from a shared atom, a shared electron from another atom. It's not really, uh, they don't want it. They're not particularly. And you look at francium here, and it's 0.8. So it's really, really low. OK, some people are thinking, what do we do with this? this electronegativity thing. So I get it. These guys here don't really care about electrons. These guys over here really like electrons. And these noble gases don't care at all whatsoever. So how does that work? Well, with this, ladies and gentlemen, we are able to go and predict, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what kind of a hookup, what kind of a bond two atoms are going to have. So let's take a look here. We're going to push this down, and we have an electronegativity chart here. you got to see it. How do we determine the type of bond between two atoms? Well, we're looking at the electronegativity difference. And as I look at my viewfinder here, I'm going to squeeze this down a little bit. There we go, so that you guys can see the whole thing. We're going to look up, we're going to pick any two atoms we want, and we can look up the electronegativity value for the two atoms involved, subtract the lower value from the higher value. It does not matter which, at, which order that the atoms come in for their electronegativity. You're always going to subtract the lower one from the higher one. And then you're going to compare the difference with this chart here. So if the difference is 0 to 0.49, it's a nonpolar covalent. If it's 0.5 to 1.7, it's polar covalent. And if it's 1.7 on the 3.3, it's ionic. You'd say, but wait a minute, you haven't talked to us about nonpolar and polar covalent. Crash course. Covalent bonds share electrons. That's the general idea. Okay. But when we look at the word polar, well, what comes in people's minds when they think about polar? They may think about that movie Polar Express with Tom Hanks, that Christmas time movie. Other people may think, ooh, the North Pole and the South Pole. They're opposites of each other. In the North Pole, you would have polar bears. In the South Pole, you have penguins. OK, you're kind of on the right path here. So polar has to do with opposites. We can look at a magnet. A magnet has a north pole and a south pole. When we put the two, two magnets, two norths together, they repel each other. If you take a north and hook it up with the south, like Paula Abdul says, opposites attract. But if you put two souths together, they push away from each other. So what does that have to do with covalent bonding? Are the electrons between the two atoms shared equally? That's the thing. And in this case here, when we look at nonpolar, we're basically saying we really don't have opposites here. So when we say nonpolar covalent, we're saying the electrons between the two atoms are shared pretty equally. Polar covalent you have an unequal sharing of electrons. They're not the same. It's still a covalent bond because the electrons are shared, but it's not equal. Okay, That's just the way uh, that it is. Now, what would this have to do with real life? Well, if we look at water, water is polar covalent as a molecule. It's got polar covalent bonds. The electrons are not equally shared between the hydrogen and the oxygen. So this means that there are areas on the water molecule where there's negative and positive charges. Oil, on the other hand, is nonpolar covalent. You don't have areas of positive and negative charges. So what happens with polar covalent? You can go dissolve things with it, as long as those things are polar covalent, like cheese. Okay, for example, you can put, you got cheese on a plate that's stuck there, 
put water on it, let water do its magical work of dissolving, breaking up the bonds, and that's it. Nonpolar covalent, you really cannot use that for dissolving things because it has no positive or negative area like the polar covalent does. Okay, so that's the difference between nonpolar covalent and polar covalent. Notice how water and oil don't mix because water cannot attach itself to the oil to rip it apart. It can't do it. Oil has no positive or negative area around it. Water's kind of stuck because water does have that positive negative area around it, but it can't do anything with oil, which is why oil and water don't mix. Oil and vinegar salad dressing. The vinegar is mostly water. That would explain why vinegar and oil, they don't mix very well. Okay, I need to move on. So, how do we predict what kind of a bonding we have between the two atoms? Well, let's go ahead. Um, on, there was a sheet that I gave people, and it looked like this. Okay, And so there are some things here. There's HH. This is our first example, and the only example I'm going to go ahead and work with you guys on. Well, I'll work it on this sheet here. So HH, two hydrogens together. Now, if I go back to my electronegativity table, okay, if I go back to my electronegativity table, I look at H and I see, oh, hey, it's a 2.1. This is the atomic number. This is not the electronegativity number. This is it right here. It's a 2.1. Okay, so if I have a 2.1 and the other one is going to be a 2.1, so over here, electronegativity difference, I have a 2.1, and you need to show your work. You have to show your work. Minus 2.1 equals zero. Okay, so that's how I know. That's my electronegativity difference. It's a zero. Well, what do I know about it? I go back, I look here, and oh, hey, look, it's a zero. Oh, HH is a nonpolar covalent. Okay, so I go back here, and it says bond type. Circle one of the following. Well, HH is a zero, and according to our chart, it's nonpolar covalent, so I'm going to circle this because it's a nonpolar covalent. Now, what about the melting point and conducting electricity? Well, we can go back to here, and let's go up, 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 up to here. We know it's a covalent bond, right? So here's our characteristic of covalent bonds. And you may notice there's no difference between polar and nonpolar covalent. Remember, we're looking at general things, general characteristics of bonding. So here, it's got a low melting point, and it cannot conduct electricity. So low melting point, it can't conduct electricity. Let's go back here. The melting point, is it high or low? Well, we looked and we found it was low, so you circle low like this. And then does it conduct electricity? Well, we looked up on the thing and it said it doesn't conduct electricity, so that's going to be a no. So that's how I would want you to fill out this electronegativity worksheet. Okay? Those are the instructions that I have for you guys on this. Now, some people may still not be totally clear on predicting bonds, so let me work on another, let me work on another one here. I'm going to go here. Here's a couple of examples. So I'm going to go and look at NaCl. Now, I already know it's an ionic bond, but let, let's, let's work with this, shall we? So let's look here. So I'm going to look at Na, Na, Na. Ah, Na is a 1.0. Cl is a 3.0. Aha. So Na and Cl, if we look, I know that Na is equal to 1.0 because that chart told me, right? Cl is equal to 3.0. Again, because that chart told me. So, you always subtract the lower from the higher. Well, wait a minute. Na is before Cl and NaCl. Yeah, but we're only interested in subtracting the lower from the higher. So, 1, 3, take away 1, gives us 2.0. That is our difference, electronegativity difference. I look up here 
oh, the 2.0 is inside this range. That means it's an ionic bond. That's what it is. Let's work on one more. Let's look at the friendliest compound, hydrogen iodide. Okay, so I am going to put this down. Let's go back up. Uh, iodide, here it is, I, it's 2.5. And here's hydrogen, it's 2.1. Okay, let's go back down here. And we know that hydrogen is equal to 2.1. All right. And, oh gosh, what was iodide, iodide again? Iodide is 2.5, okay. So iodide is equal to 2.5. So 2.5 take away 2.1 equals 0 0.4. That's our electronegativity difference. This is how we can predict the bonds Okay, and we're going to go up, 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 down, 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 whoops. I gotta go the other way here, and it was a 0.4. I look here, aha, the HI is a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay, so this is it. You got to learn how, what is electronegativity, the ability of an atom to attract a shared electron from another atom, the higher the number, the more it wants it. The lower the number, the less it wants it. We looked at the idea about covalent bonding, sharing electrons. We also looked at ionic bonding, where an electron will transfer from one atom to the next. We also looked at how we can predict what kind of bonds that two atoms will have based off of their electronegativity difference. And we did examples here to show our point. Okay, we looked at sodium, we looked at uh, hydrogen iodide. Earlier we looked on that worksheet here, okay, where we looked at hydrogen. It says 2.1, take away 2.1 is equal to zero. And we saw, hey, it's a nonpolar covalent. We saw that it has a low melting point and it doesn't conduct electricity uh, very well. Okay, this concludes this portion dealing with electronegativity and bonding and how to fill out the electronegativity worksheet. Okay. Hey, I hope this has been beneficial for you guys and you take it easy and I'll catch you the next time.